for you there. <clears throat> and it's good to see you, Andrew. Good to see you too, Papa. Okay. How can I be of help? Um, if you all have a question, you could raise your hand and I'll uh, call on you and Mr. Uh, yeah, Mr. Friedman can answer for you. Um, CJ. How was it like fighting at age 18 in the army for World War II? I, I couldn't hear you, please speak again. How was it like to fight in World War II when you were just 18? What was it like to fight in World War II when you were oh, just 18? Well, it was seen very normal. Uh, everyone was doing it and uh, I didn't feel any different from anyone else. I just did my job and that was my job. Thank you. Um, Gardner? What would you say is the hardest part of that journey? Well, I didn't find it particularly hard. Uh, I, as you say, I was only 18, 19, um, 20. And uh, <clears throat> I was doing it and I had my buddies, which I think is, are called a band of brothers. And uh, we did what we were asked to do. It seemed very normal. <clears throat> there were things that were hard, like sleeping in foxholes. What? Sleeping in foxholes, that was hard. Well, sleeping in a foxhole is uh, something you got used to. What was very funny was that uh, <clears throat> the first night I slept in a foxhole, I put on my pajamas. <laughs> and I never did it again. <laughs> and the other thing I did, <clears throat> was I carried with me throughout the war uh, sock stretchers, which I still have. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't get what was called trench foot. So every night <clears throat> I would take off my steel helmet, wash my socks and put them on the sock stretchers, which I carried on my back and they, the socks would dry so that the next night I would have clean socks. And I never did get trench foot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman, would you mind just describing what a foxhole is for the students? I think some of them might be unfamiliar with what that is. Oh, <clears throat> a foxhole was a hole we would dig every night uh, you know, and crawl into it so that everything above our helmet was below ground. And therefore, if anyone tried to shoot us, uh, they couldn't see us because we were underground. <clears throat> uh, there, I can tell you some stories about foxholes if you're interested. Would you like to hear a story about a foxhole? Okay. <clears throat> uh, the first night that we were in combat, our commander had us dig foxholes under a line of trees. And that turned out to be a disaster because the Germans would shoot their weapons into the trees and they would explode and fall down on us so that the foxhole <clears throat> was no, didn't work. And the more interesting story about a foxhole was one day my buddy Carl Schendel and I dug a foxhole together because the ground was very frozen. <clears throat> and when we were finished, we squeezed into it and we took turns staying awake because we were at the point of our defense. In other words, we were the first persons that any Germans would come, would see if they tried to attack us. <clears throat> I was asleep and Schendel was supposed to be in charge but he fell asleep too. And the next thing that happened <coughs> was I felt a tapping on my helmet. And I looked up and I went, I see two German soldiers. And so I said in my best German, what do you want? <laughs> and they both put their hands over their heads. In other words, <clears throat> they both surrendered to me while I was asleep. 
it, you like that Fox Soul different. story? It could have been a different story. What? I said the alternative ending would not have been so good. Well, if, yeah. if, they, if the German soldiers had decided otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you today. <clears throat> anyway, that's, that's my favorite foxhole story. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. Yeah, the, that was you really can't funny. hear it over here, but the <laughs> students are quite tickled by that one. Um, Sienna. Was there one memory that really stands that stood out to you? Like one something that happened except for the Germans in the foxhole that really stood out to you? Your injury. Well, the, the one thing that sticks in my mind, of course, is the liberation of the Mauthausen concentration camp. Uh, that's something that I didn't expect to see. And it was horrifying to see all the dead bodies and the emaciated prisoners. <clears throat> uh, I had no way of knowing what a concentration camp was. But uh, that's something that sticks in my mind. You're coming into the camp and seeing those poor people. And then even in that camp, I had an experience which I'll never forget because <clears throat> one of my duties was to keep peace among the inmates. And one day I found two of them trying to kill each other. And so I, took my rifle and I pointed at him and I said, stop, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, you were both prisoners in the concentration camp. And one of them said in English, you Americans don't understand. <clears throat> He's a Pole and I'm a Czech. Well, I don't understand that. And I never did. And that stuck with me. Okay. Wow. Do you want me to say anything to make up, to tell you about the history of this? Is this a history class that I'm this, talking to? This is a history and English class. We've been reading the diary of Anne Frank, um, but we're interested in whatever you have to share with us. We're, we're well, really eager. Well, history is very important. There's a saying, if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to read to re-experience it. And we should all learn from the history of World War I and II. Actually, World War I and II were the same war. World War II was just a continuation. At the end of World War I, the Germans who lost the war were treated very badly. And they resented it. And then on top of that, there was a depression, economic depression, which started in 1929. And it hit Germany very well, very strongly. And there were a lot of unemployed people in Germany. And <clears throat> because of the burden of reparations that they had to pay to the allies, they were in terrible trouble. And so there, there was a division in the government between the communists and the fascists. And the, got the businessmen in the country preferred the fascists to the communists. And so they eventually appointed Adolf Hitler as the chancellor, which is the prime minister. And that led to the terrible uh, things that happened to people in Germany, Poland, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and the rest of Europe. So you have to learn that, that, that uh, economic depression can cause a lot of problems. And in the United States, we would face the same problems. And fortunately, Roosevelt chose neither communism, President Roosevelt called, calls neither, chose neither communism nor fascism for the middle ground. And we eventually emerged into the democracy that we have had since 
1789. Does that make sense to you or do you have any questions about that? Okay. You wait, you shake your head. What is your question? No. They have to unmute themselves. Jackson, I think it was. was oh, no, uh, I was just um, nodding my head that I understood and then I shook my head that I didn't have any questions. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> But Jackson, your hand is up. Do you have another question? You'd oh, yeah, like I have ask? a question to ask about, not about this stuff. Go ahead, ask me anything. Um, did you make any really good friends in the military? Yes, we were eight of us who were very close and remain close to this day. And as of today, there are only two of us left. The other guys have all died and I miss them terribly. There's something about forming bonds in battle that are eternal. And I think of those guys almost every day. But that's no reason to. Was one of them the one who saved your life? No. I love that story. Oh, oh you want to, well, the fellow who saved my life was not one of my buddies. He was actually my commanding officer. <laughs> and uh, why he saved my life, I'll never know. But I thanked him and kept in touch with him until he died. <clears throat> I, I was wounded. One of my jobs was to sit on the top of a tank, not inside, but on top of it. And why on top? because we had to protect the tank from German soldiers sneaking up on it and throwing what are called Molotov cocktails on the tank. A Molotov cocktail was a bottle filled with flammable gasoline, which they would set on fire, throw at the tank, and then the tank would catch fire. <clears throat> and it was my task to prevent them from doing that. Unfortunately, uh, the German tanks were shooting at my tank and they hit it, but they didn't disable it. But when they hit it, the, the bomb or the 88 millimeter uh, projectile exploded and the shrapnel of it cut off the left side of my face, including my ear. You can still and see the scar. What? You can show them the scar. Well, I have a scar. I don't know if you can see it or not. <laughs> you have to turn that way more. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it looked like a, a dueling scar, but it was a shell scar. And so I jumped off the tank and I there was about there were about two feet of snow. And I saw the snow turning red. And I was very peaceful. I I figured I was going to die, and it didn't bother me at all. And then some, suddenly somebody jumped off another vehicle and applied a, a bandage to the open wound and stopped the bleeding until a met medic came along and drove me back to the field hospital where I was sewn back together. Uh, <clears throat> he was one of my bridge opponents we used to play bridge with him and he was better than I and I think he saved my life because he needed someone he could beat at bridge. <laughs> uh, anyway, we remained friends uh, until he died. And he disobeyed orders <clears throat> to save you, right? He what? He was not supposed to, no, to stop. No, he, he, he was not supposed to save me, but he needed, he needed someone <laughs> to beat at bridge. So that's I'm just lucky. Any other questions? Valentina? Did you cry a lot? Did you cry a lot? <laughs> Did I cry? During the war? No. I was just doing my job. And, Did anything uh, make you emotional? Well, the only thing that made me emotional was seeing the prisoners in the concentration camp. Right. But, uh, I was taught that uh, uh, 
not to cry and uh, I don't know, everything seemed pretty normal. When you live in that kind of an environment, uh, you don't cry about it, okay? <clears throat> Any other questions? Holly? Was there any memory from the war that is like really stuck to you in it, like in a good way? Like in a good your, way? Like your favorite memory, yeah. In a good way, it was, the war was a marvelous experience for me because until I went into the army, I had never traveled out of the United States. And so I went to England and France and Germany in Austria, and I got to see how other people live. And I made these very close friends. We were all from different backgrounds. One of the fellows was so poor that he had never traveled much. His father was the janitor in an apartment building in Chicago, and he had never traveled more than two blocks from his house. Another one of my friends inherited $15 million when he was born. So we were really from very different backgrounds. And some were Christians, some were that is a, a Protestant, some were Catholic, and some were Jewish. And that didn't make any difference. We were just buddies together with a common cause. And we became good friends and remain good friends. And we would see each other after the war uh, at a reunion every year until they, and then I got to know the wives and then they started to disappear too. And now just two of us left. And both of our wives have also left us. <clears throat> Morgan? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Michael, um, uh, well, what were you expecting of going into the concentration camp and how did it surprise you seeing it? We didn't expect, we had heard there were concentration camps, but we didn't know what they really were. It wasn't until the war ended that, they re that we would learn that the concentration meant extermination. So the people in the camps were made to work for the Nazis, but they were made to work so hard and given so little care that they were expected to die. And if they caused any trouble, they were just killed because they had what they called gas chambers where they would tell them they're getting showers and the showers turned out to be poison gas and then they would be put into ovens and incinerated. Okay. Any other questions? Gardner? Gardner, did you raise your hand? I, I'm so sorry about those um, six people who died, I'm sorry for your loss. And you must have gone through so much. You're, you're so, um, that's amazing what you went through. Well, I didn't go through anything unusual. There were, there were millions of American soldiers and British soldiers who fought and those who fought in the Pacific for an even more difficult war than those of us in Europe. So it was something that you did because you had to. There was really no alternative. We were attacked and we responded. Okay. And Jackson? Um, uh, wait, wait, where did you fight? Um, where was your, uh, where did you fight? Oh. In the war? <clears throat> um, 
uh, in uh, September, after the Normandy had already been invaded, my unit <clears throat> was sent to England, where we spent oh. where we spent a couple of months getting ready to go to the continent, and then. And Oh, sorry. Yeah, keep going. Then in December of 1944, we shipped out and landed in Normandy. And there were still pockets of Germans who were fighting. And we were assigned to an area called Saint-Nazaire, where we were supposed to uh, <clears throat> get rid of the German pocket. But uh, the day we were to arrive, the German army broke through the Ardennes forest, which is in Belgium, and we're headed for the port of Antwerp because they wanted to divide the American forces, which were south of that line, from the British who were north of that line. Mm -hmm. And so we took two days on a forced march, never stopping until we got to Belgium. And um, my main question was, because my grandfather, he fought in the war and he fought in that time and place. Uh -huh. And he was a pilot uh -huh. and he recently died, but his name was Stanley George. And I was wondering if you ever met him. No, I didn't know any of my fellows in the Air Force. Uh, I had a cousin who was in the Air Force and he visited me <clears throat> while I was in the hospital in England recovering from my war wounds. And he was shot down over Germany, but he, he landed and was rescued by the uh, underground <clears throat> and brought back to, the, to England where his uh, unit was. And he never really recovered. He had uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome from that shooting down. Because you can imagine being in the air, having to parachute to ground and being Jewish. If he had been captured by the Germans, he would not have survived. So the rest of his life was destroyed by that event. Uh, but I didn't know uh, any guys in the Air Force. I tried to get into the Air Force, but my, my eyes were so bad that uh, they wouldn't take me. So I did what I was asked to do. <clears throat> okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Morgan, I see your hand up. So were you was it your choice to join the army or were you kind of like forced? i was drafted as i said i tried to get into the air force but uh, they wouldn't take me because of my eyes and i didn't apply for the navy because i get seasick even on a bridge crossing a river so i figured i never wouldn't do very well in the navy so i just waited until I knew when I was 18 that the army would draft me and I went, it was just normal, nothing special. <clears throat> okay, uh, I can tell you that w since I graduated from high school when I was 17, I had a year before I would be drafted. And so I went to college during that year. And while I was in college, I studied Japanese. And when I went into the army, I was told that I would become an interpreter. But because I was only 18 and had only one year of college, the army said it would send me to school for a year because you had to be either 21 or at two years of college before they would uh, put you into the um, uh, army language school, which seemed like a silly rule, but it was a rule. 
And so they sent me to school for a year. But uh, after three months, they decided that instead of sending me to school and then to the Japanese language school, uh, they needed uh, gun, was it uh, gunpowder? Huh? Boots on the ground. Yeah, they needed me on, on the ground and they sent me to the 11th Armored Division, which went to Europe. And so my Japanese wasn't very useful in Europe. <laughs> <clears throat> Oxy? Um, would you change anything about your experience or are you content, or are you content with what you went through? Well, I don't think you can change history. Uh, I'm, I will say that I did what I was asked to do. I didn't complain and uh, I came out of it alive. Uh, as you know, I was, I was wounded in, in Belgium in the Battle of the Bulge, and I was sent to Luxembourg where the doctor sewed me up. And I asked the, uh, the doctor if he was a plastic surgeon, and he said, no, he wasn't, but he'd do the best he could. So if you can see, it didn't turn out too badly. Then they sent me to Paris to recuperate. And I had a view of the Eiffel Tower from my bedroom in Paris. And since I had the side of my face all sewn up, uh, I couldn't open my mouth or chew. So I had to live on chocolate milkshakes. And I would get a bowl of chocolate milkshake for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner. And since it was more than I could handle, I became very popular with the guys in the hospital because I could share a chocolate milkshake with them. <laughs> and then I went, they sent me to England to recuperate further. It was a, uh, a group where they would uh, <clears throat> rehabilitate you. And one of the guys in the group, for example, had his hand cut off and so they sewed it back together and then he kept practicing moving his hand and he would try to move his thumb and his pinky would move or so forth and they kept re-operating on him until finally he was able to use all of his fingers and my task was to learn how to chew and so my rehabilitation was to chew gum <laughs> And gradually, I was able to not only chew gum, but to chew regular food. And so I recovered. And then I couldn't wait to get back to my buddies because the bonds were very strong and I knew they needed me. And so I went back. Okay. Did you have any, or were you nervous or did you have any apprehension when you joined the army or were you just ready for duty? No, I, I took everything in stride. And I know one of the questions was, was I ever afraid? And I, I never was because when you, I, I don't know if this is true of everybody, but I, until I was hit, I figured I was invincible. Because when you're 19 years old, you are invincible. You never think about death. So uh, I just did what I was supposed to do. And my buddies all did the same thing. We all did what we were supposed to do. And uh, after I did get hit uh, and returned, I was a little bit nervous about getting hit again. But by that time, uh, we were... Uh, quite uh, successful. My unit was already deep into Germany, so it was uh, there was nothing to be afraid of. The war was almost over, right? It was getting close to the end, yeah. And uh, so I, I never, um, I may, I don't know why, but I was never afraid. I just figured everything would be fine. 
and it turned out, I mean, I'm still around long after I expected to be. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Asher? I, I hope none of you ever have to have the experience that I had. Uh, you have to somehow keep uh, this country from war, but you may not be able to avoid it because the decision may not be ours. There are people in the world who are jealous of what we have in the United States and armaments have become more and more terrifying. And so if there's another war, I doubt that it'll be anything like the one in which I served. I wish you all peace and happiness and be vigilant because what happened in Germany could happen here. <clears throat> um, Asher, would you like to ask a question? I'm sorry? Asher's gonna ask a question. Oh. Uh, you asked me to- Here, uh, uh, that was, a, that was an accident, Asher. Jackson, sorry about that. Asher, just say it. Uh, Asher says, what do you get, what do you usually do in training every day? Do you do anything special or? Oh, we were in, I was in the best physical shape I've ever been in because we would do calisthenics, we would hike. And uh, one of my buddies always hid in the barracks behind a, a big bag when we went out to exercise. <laughs> He's still alive. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Valentina? A lot of questions. What did you eat in a day? Well, we had what were called C rations and K rations. C rations were cans of food and K rations were dry food in boxes. And uh, I remember the day before we had our first combat, I went into a, a small town in Belgium and I saw a restaurant. So I went into the restaurant with one couple of my buddies and I said, can we buy dinner? And they said, we can serve you dinner, but you have to bring the food because we don't have any. So we brought some sea rations and they put some marvelous uh, sauce over it. And we had a delicious meal <laughs> out of the sea rations. They tasted a lot better in that restaurant than they did out in the field. <clears throat> did you like them? Did I what? Like them. Like the food? Yeah. Well, when you're hungry, eat whatever you can get. <laughs> uh, but that food that the restaurant served was delicious, but it was mostly because of the sauce. <laughs> and one of the things that we had was called Spam. I think they still sell that, don't they? And yeah. It was not one of my favorite foods. But I ate it. <clears throat> Did you have any questions about the Holocaust? No. Does anybody, uh, Michael? Do you have a question? Uh, it's it's related to um, what happens in the concentration camp. So when when you were going into the camp and you saw everyone and everything that was going on. Did you see any, so what were the, um, the, the prisoners of war doing then? Like what were all the Jewish, Jewish people doing then? Like what, what were the reactions to you guys coming in and liberating the camp? Well, the people in the concentration camps weren't only Jewish. There, there were 
communists, there were gay people, there were disabled people. Uh, the Jews were mostly in the extermination camp in, Aus in uh, Poland called Auschwitz in the, in the camp that we liberated, there were Jewish people as well as people who were not Jewish, but were political prisoners. And the concentration camps really weren't known by most of us until the war ended because they were kept very private. The first concentration camp was called Buchenwald, and that was not far from Berlin. And originally they put political prisoners in Buchenwald. And then gradually they decided to get rid of all the Jews in Europe. And so they built a concentration camp in Austria, I mean, in Poland called Auschwitz, and they would send people there and then as they got off the trains, they would be sent almost immediately to gas chambers. Uh, Mauthausen was mostly political prisoners. Uh, Simon the Weissenthal was uh, one of the Jewish prisoners and he became a, a Nazi hunter after the war. Uh, but a lot of the prisoners there were not Jewish. Um, but, uh, Dad, I think they're what, like, could you describe the day you liberated the camp? So the German soldiers had fled, right? Yeah, we arrived in Mauthausen on the day the Germans surrendered. And the inmates at Mauthausen had already taken over the camp and either killed the German guards or the German guards had fled. So we were greeted by the inmates. Uh, then a few they days were very, later- They were hungry and they were well, they very were, sick. Right? They had no food and we had to take care of them. And we couldn't feed them too much because if, we, if they ate too much, it would kill them. And then a few days later, we went to another camp called Guzen. And Guzen was mostly Jewish uh, inmates. And what they were doing during the day was digging a factory into a hill outside of the town of Guzen because they were gonna use that factory to manufacture airplanes. And uh, those prisoners, uh, those uh, inmates, <clears throat> had captured some of the German guards and they were drowning them in an open cesspool. It was pretty awful. Uh, anyway, I've never been to Mount Helsing. I mean, I've never been to Auschwitz, but uh, I have a story about Auschwitz. Uh, Walter Matthau was a famous American actor and he was filming a movie in Berlin. And he said to his wife, while we're in Berlin, why don't we go and see Auschwitz? And she said, I don't want to see a concentration camp. And he kept saying, well, we're so close, we ought to see it. And finally, one day she said, okay, I'll go to Auschwitz with you. And Walter Malthaus said, you've delayed so long, you've spoiled Auschwitz for me. <laughs> so, that's my Auschwitz story. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, did you, um, I have two questions. Did you ever shoot anyone or like um, kill anyone in the war? Yes. And my other question was, um, what weapons did you use when you went? Well, I used mostly what was called an M1 rifle, but I also used a, a mechanism called a bazooka. Have you ever heard of a bazooka? 
It's like a long yeah. tube and you put a- It's like a rocket launcher. Put a rocket into it and shoot. And so, uh, we, I use that against, with, with, as a matter of fact, Shandell and I used it together to shoot at German tanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, and could you say, do you have any more really interesting stories? Interesting stories. Because, or all, well, all the ones you said are really interesting, and I would like to hear some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, England, while we were stationed in England, that was very interesting because the British said that the problem with American soldiers was that they were oversexed, overpaid, and over here. <laughs> But uh, didn't bother us any. And since most of the guys in my unit uh, only wanted to go to the local bar, uh, my buddies and I would go to London every time we could get a pass. And we got free tickets to the theater. And we always had the best seats in the house. And so I saw some great plays with some great actors while I was in London. And I got to know London pretty well. I had one funny experience in London, and that was uh, we went to a French restaurant because we knew we were going to go to France. And I decided when I looked at the menu to order Livier, thinking it was liver, but I had never studied French. Do you know what Livier is? Anybody? Rabbit. <laughs> I thought that was Latin. <laughs> so I was kind of surprised when my liver order turned into what looked like a chicken, <laughs> but it was really a rabbit. Uh, and then when I got out of the uh, hospital, I was given a week's leave before I returned to my unit. And I used that week to hitchhike from Bournemouth, which is near the English Channel to Edinburgh in Scotland. And since I had rowed in an eight or shell when I was in college, I decided to stop at Oxford on the way because my coach had been at Oxford before he came to my college. And I, well, I was just walking around the campus and I saw a guy in a gown because he was an undergrad, all undergraduates wore gowns. And I said, can you tell me where the boathouse is? And he said, which boathouse? And I said, well, the university boathouse. He said, well, I'm headed there now. And he turned out to be the captain of the university college crew. And so we went to the boathouse. And when we got there, they were one guy short of the in order for an eight or shell, and they asked me if I would row with them. And I said I would, except that the British use the long layback and we use the short layback. And I was afraid that they'd poke into me when I was rowing. So they said, <clears throat> we have a, a solution for that. You can be the stroke. So but as the stroke, I was the, the guy closest to the stern and I could take my short way back and there was no one in front of me to bump into it. And so I, for well, one day, I was the stroke of the Oxford University College group. Nice. And I became friends with the captain of the crew and he and I remained friends throughout his life and I'm still friends with his children and grandchildren. So that was a marvelous experience. Anyway. So in, in the war, you know, you make the best of what, the, what opportunities you have. So I had theater, I had university, and I had friends. And, uh, well, that's not what was the war was about. That was my war. And I did the best I could. 
<clears throat> Thank you, CJ. I'm sorry. I actually forgot my question. Andrew can ask questions. Too. What? If, if Andrew has any questions. Andrew. Uh, I have one question. Um, did you find any Germans in other people's houses, or did you find any Germans hiding anywhere? Did I what? Find Germans hiding, or find Germans in other people's houses? Well, most of the German soldiers I encountered were out in the field. Although when we got into Germany, instead of sleeping in foxholes, we would sleep in the German houses. Oh, there is one incident which you might find interesting. <clears throat> Soon after I rejoined my outfit, after I'd been in the hospital, my squad got very far ahead of the rest of the unit. And while the rest of the army was catching up with us, we were in the town called Kulmbach. K-U-L-M-B-A-C-H. And Kumbach happened to be very famous for its beer. And we found that the most secure place to defend ourselves was the brewery. And so we moved into the brewery and arranged ourselves at different points to protect ourselves from any mean by German soldiers. And incidentally, we drank a lot of beer. And I'm still very fond of Kumbach beer, although I don't drink anymore. <clears throat> Michael? So. Um, so, uh, so when you were um, a, a, um, an active duty, and you were fighting against the Germans. What were you? What, who um, did you? Did you ever get close to the lines and see them? Or did you ever go? Uh, who? Wh where were you positioned? Usually. Well, I, I where, what was your position on the on the line? Like how close to the front lines were you? Oh, I was a private. And my job was to shoot at German soldiers, which I did. And so I did my job and I captured a number of people and I shot a number of people. Um, you should day, tell them the story though about the captain who ordered you to do something and you said no. Oh. Um, <clears throat> Early in the in my war, uh, my unit saw a motorcycle, <clears throat> with the motor still running in front of a house. And so my commanding officer said, Friedman, go see who's in that house. So I said, I said, why? He said, well, you speak German. Well, I didn't speak German very well, but I went up to the house and I knocked on the door and I said in my best German, kommen Sie heraus, which means come out. And the door opened very slowly and I saw a woman and she kept saying, Seville, Seville. And so I turned back to my buddies and I said, Harry, She's speaking French. You speak French. So why don't you come up here? <laughs> he kept pointing at the door. And when I turned around, I saw that the door had opened. And inside the door, there were a whole bunch of German soldiers. So I took my rifle and I swung it around. And unfortunately, I had a sharp bayonet at the end of my rifle. And the bayonet went into the lintel of the door. And there I was with my arms holding on to a rifle that was stuck in the door. And all these Germans facing me. 
And what those Germans did was they all put their heads on top of their heads. And the officer in charge came to me while I was pulling my rifle out of the door and handed me his Luger pistol. And 16 of them surrendered to me. And so when I took them back, my company commander said, we can't take care of this many prisoners. Would you please, it's, I order you to shoot them all. And I said, I don't kill prisoners. And I turned my back on him and walked away. So he got somebody else to kill them all, which was not very nice. That's one of my sad memories of the war. So in wartime, atrocities are committed by everybody on both sides. Although I did never, I never committed an atrocity. I, I just, I, I always had, I was raised by my parents not to lie or cheat or to kill unnecessarily. So I killed enough, but only in the line of duty, never killed a prisoner. I, I I thought you were studying the Holocaust. But do you know? Are there questions about the Holocaust that you might have? Yeah, let's. We have a few more minutes. Could we reserve this for questions about the Holocaust or things related to what we've been studying? I think um, I think students have been really <laughs> taken by your stories, and I think they're um, asking about uh, these questions because your stories are so fascinating. Um, but Michael, do you have a question? So uh, I know quite a lot about who all went to the concentration camps. It was mostly Jew Jewish communists. There's um, uh, right. gay, 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 gay people, people, people and gay gypsies. People. And gypsies, yes, gypsies. Gay oh. people and gypsies. Were there any others, like small minorities? Disabled people. Well, if you were disabled, for example, I have a daughter who has Down syndrome. Well, she would have been sent to, not to a concentration camp, but to an extermination hospital. Uh, the, uh, Wait, what's an extermination hospital? Because um, it has hospital, which means he, like a healing hospital, but it has extermination, which means kill. Yeah, but they, they would send these disabled people to a hospital and experiment on them and if they didn't die in the experiment, they would be euthanized and killed. So uh, it was pretty awful. Uh, the, the, way the, the way the Holocaust started was uh, Hitler was appointed chancellor, which is the same as prime minister, by the president of Germany, who was Paul von Hindenburg. He had been a general in World War I. And the first thing that Hitler did after he was appointed general, uh, ch uh, chancellor was to say that the universities were overcrowded and therefore Jews couldn't attend because they had to make the universities less crowded. And so the Jews were eliminated. And then the next thing they did was they, said that Jews couldn't be teachers. Uh, and so they lost their jobs as teachers. And then eventually they decided that just like the Germans wore armbands with swastikas on them, the Jews would wear armbands that said Jew on the armband. And then the Jews, businesses had the windows smeared with the word Jew on the windshield, on the windows. And people were told not to patronize businesses that were owned by Jews. Uh, <clears throat> there was a famous uh, 
German minister. He was a Lutheran minister. His name was Martin Neumiller. And he said, first, they came after the socialists. And I was not a socialist. And so I did nothing. Then they came after the uh, trade unionists. And I was not a trade unionist. And so I did nothing. And then they came after the Jews. And I was not Jewish. So I did nothing. And then they came after me. And there was no one to speak for me. And that sort of summed up what happened in Germany. People gradually were discriminated against for no reason until the only people left were people who were loyal to the Nazis. And they fought in the war until the Russians captured Berlin and Hitler committed suicide. It was a very sad tale <laughs> that a great country like Germany would fall to such terrible conditions. And the reason that Germany has returned to the community of nations is that the United States Marshall Plan, unlike the reparations plan after World War I helped Germany to rebuild itself. And so the Germans have developed a very civil society. But for the 11 years that the Nazis were in charge, it kept getting worse and worse. <clears throat> Mr. Friedman, it was, is it okay if we ask one more question? We have just a couple minutes left, but there's one last question here. Any questions, I'll answer if I can. Thank you. Uh, Matteo. Uh, similar to the story of Anne Frank, did you, did you ever run to someone who, were, who was in hiding or any families that were in hiding? No, I, I only met them after the war. <laughs> I didn't meet them during the war, but after the war, I met some families who had been uh, rescued by local people. I knew a family who were Jewish and in Czechoslovakia, and they were protected by the Catholic Church uh, during the war, and they survived. So there were, there were good people and bad people. And there always will be. And I hope all of you will turn out to be good people. Well, I think we, we need to wrap things up because the school day is ending. But thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Friedman. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. So brave and amazing. It was all of my life. I can't put my advice on asking you to do on that. Draw your lives. I just want to. I just want to say thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Okay. What are you saying? Democracy. Democracy needs to. Be cherished and protected always okay so thank long. you Ms. thank you so much for your time mr friedman this thank, you very much. Thank, thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you so much thank you thank you for spending your time thank you for talking to us thank you bye thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so much